Hi guys, in this video we're going to be looking at the link between electricity and redox reactions, splitting up redox reactions, half cells with metals in solution, half cells with gases, half cells with only aqueous ions, we'll then look at which half cell is which, the standard hydrogen electrode, and then finally we'll summarise. From our videos on redox reactions, we know that redox reactions involve the transfer of electrons. So when a redox reaction happens, say between lithium and chlorine, the lithium will lose an electron, which we know is oxidation, and the chlorine will gain one, which we know is reduction. Another thing you may also know is that the flow of electrons is associated with electrical energy. So this here would be a wire, and the yellow particles moving represent our electrons flowing down the wire, carrying electrical energy. So what if we could use redox reactions, which involve the movement of electrons, as a source of electrical energy? If we can understand how the electrons flow, and from which elements to which other elements, then we could potentially have a source of electrical energy. If we're going to be able to harness this electrical energy, we need to think about the redox reaction in two parts. So we can split the full reaction equation into two half equations. We've got an oxidation equation where we generate electrons. So from our example from the previous slide, we would have lithium separating from its electrons as a source of electrons, along with a reduction equation where, in our example, we could have a copper 2 plus iron combining with two electrons to form elemental copper, and here the electrons that were generated in the lithium oxidation equation are used up in the copper reduction equation. If we want to be able to utilise the flow of electrons to make a cell, and remember, a cell you may have heard of in the real world as batteries, but a cell is a more precise scientific term. We separate these processes in the chemical equation into half cells, so that for the reaction to happen, electrons have to flow between them. So in the redox reaction, you will have an oxidation half cell, which is generating electrons. Those electrons then have to flow through a wire to get to the reduction half cell. And it's the process of having them flow through the wire that transfers electrical energy, which we can then harness by putting some sort of application, some sort of device, in the way. So if we're going to make cells, how do we set up these half cells to generate and use the electrons? Well, a key feature of all half cells is that they contain a particular element in two different oxidation states. Remember, an oxidation state tells us how many electrons have been gained or lost from the elements. The most simple half cell to look at is where we place a metal in a solution of its ions. So in our example here, we have an electrode, which means this is the part of the cell that the electrons flow in and out of, and this is made of copper solid, so elemental copper. This is placed in some sort of beaker, which contains a solution of copper 2 plus ions. We need to standardise these half cells so that we can talk about the reactions they'll be involved in. So it's important to specify with solutions the concentration. A standard half cell will always have one mole per decimeter cubed concentration for solutions of ions. When we set up a half cell like this, ions in the solution are reduced and metal atoms are being oxidised so that we have an equilibrium. At the same time, we have some of the metal losing its electrons and flowing into the solution as ions, and we have some of the ions recombining with their electrons and becoming a metal which would then build up on the electrode. So we can display that as this equation here, where we have the copper 2 plus ions in the solution recombining with their electrons to form the copper solid. It's very important that all of these half cells are equilibriums. We've got a flow in both directions. The copper is both breaking away from its electrons and the ions are recombining. And when these are happening at the same rate, we form this equilibrium. 
The equation is called the half cell equation, and it's convention to always have the for forward direction going from left to right as the gain of electrons, reduction of a species. It's not always as simple as having a metal electrode that is being oxidised into its ions in solution. Sometimes one of the oxidation states that's present is a gas. We can still make half cells which involve gases by bubbling the gas through the liquid, the solution, containing the ions that also take place in the redox reaction. We also have to give a surface for the reaction to take place on. So a diagram of a half cell involving a gas would look like this. We have a glass tube here into which we force pressurised gas. So in this example we'll talk about a chlorine half cell. So we would have chlorine gas. And again, as with the concentrations of the solution, it's important to standardise these half cells so that we can compare them. So when we have gases, they are always put into the half cell at a pressure of 101 kilopascals. The solution they're bubbled through contains the ions which also take place in the redox reaction. So here we would have Cl- ions in solution, and again the concentration would be one mole per decimeter cubed. We have to give a surface for the gas and the solution to react on, and we also need some method of transferring electrons into and out of the half cell for the redox reaction to take place. For this, we use a platinum electrode, and then this is what we need to set up the half cell. The chlorine gas is being reduced, it's gaining electrons, and the ions are being oxidised. The following equilibrium is set up, so we have the chlorine gas gaining two electrons and becoming chloride ions. Remember that the changes happen in both directions, so the chloride ions are also losing electrons and forming chlorine gas again. When these happen at the same rate, we have our dynamic equilibrium and the system is stable. There are some points to note about the platinum electrode. The reason we use platinum is because it's inert, which means it doesn't react, it's so therefore it won't affect the redox reaction. It also conducts electricity so provides a way to add or remove electrons from the half cell. The electrode is coated at the bottom in platinum black, which is a porous coating. This means it has bubbles, it's foamy within it, and this gives a large surface area so that the redox reaction has lots of surface to take place on. However, sometimes both the oxidation states that are present in our half cell are aqueous solutions. So here we must construct half cells with an equimolar solution. This means we have the same amount, or the same concentration rather, of each of our solutions containing the different oxidation numbers of the element. We still use a platinum electrode for the same reasons as before, to provide or remove electrons from the half cell. So this is how you would draw a diagram of a half cell that involves two lots of aqueous ions, and then you would label it to show the different components. So again, we have our platinum electrode, and then we'd label our solution to show that it contains iron 2 plus, this is going to be the example we're using for our half cell that contains two lots of aqueous ions, we're going to have aqueous iron 2 plus with a concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed, and we're also going to have Fe3 plus in the solution, and this has to be the same concentration. So this is almost an exception to what we've seen before, where the other solutions had to be one mole per decimeter cubed. When we're mixing two lots of ions, for it to be a standard cell, they just have to be the same. Often this means that we pick one mole per decimeter cubed for them to be the same concentration, but this could be them both having two moles per decimeter cubed or three. As long as they're the same, it forms a standard cell. Again, an equilibrium will be set up between these two oxidation states. So we're going to have our iron 3 plus in this example, gaining an electron and forming iron 2 plus in the solution. But remember, it's a dynamic equilibrium, so the iron 2 plus is at the same time losing electrons and forming iron 3. 
This happens in both directions and we get an equilibrium set up. So you should remember that when we started this video, we talked about making a full cell from two half cells, where we have an oxidation and a reduction half cell. But then when we looked at building our half cells, we've made it very clear that each half cell contains both a reduction and an oxidation process, which takes place in equilibrium. So if we connect two of these half cells, then which one provides electrons and becomes the oxidation half cell, and which one uses them up as the reduction half cell? Remember, we need some overall reaction like this so that we can have the flow of electrons to generate our electricity. The key point with working out which half cell is going to be which is that the equilibriums that are set up in the half cell equations have different positions. We can now think about combining a copper half cell that we've looked at, where we would have a copper solid electrode in a solution of Cu2 plus ions, with a chlorine electrode where we have the chlorine gas bubbling through a solution of chloride ions. If the equilibrium for these reactions lies further to the left, or for the reaction where the equilibrium lies further to the left, the half cell is better at releasing electrons. In this case, it is the copper that is better at releasing electrons because the equilibrium position is further to the left. Whereas if the equilibrium lies further to the right, the half cell is better at accepting electrons. So in our example, the chlorine half cell has an equilibrium further to the right than the copper one, and so will be better at accepting electrons. It's now clear that the direction of electron flow, so which will be an oxidation half cell and which will be a reduction one, depends on the cells we connect. For one cell, we may have a copper half cell acting as the oxidation half cell, and if we combined it with a, a different other half cell, then it could become the reduction one. The standard electrode potential, which we give the symbol E standard, is what we use to measure this. What we use to measure how much the half cell either releases or accepts electrons, which is in turn the position of equilibrium for these half cell equations. So we've now seen that the standard electrode potential, which is a number we assign to half cells, tells us about that half cell's tendency to accept or release electrons. Before we see how that works in more detail, there's another important thing to consider. Half cells can only release or accept electrons if they are attached to something else to release them to or accept them from. Electrons can't just appear out of nowhere or disappear into nowhere, so we need a source or a sink for the electrons. To measure the standard electrode potentials, so how much a half cell is donating electrons or accepting them, it needs to be connected to another half cell. We use a particular half cell as a reference so that we can compare standard electrode potentials for all the others. The reference cell we choose is a hydrogen half cell. The diagram for the hydrogen half cell looks like this, which should seem familiar because it's very similar to the half cells we used for gases and aqueous ions. In fact, it's exactly the same. The standard hydrogen half cell is a half cell that involves hydrogen gas, H2, being bubbled through a solution and the pressure it's bubbled through at is the standard pressure of 100 kilopascals. The solution contains H plus ions at a concentration of one mole per decimeter cube. The source of these H plus ions is usually hydrochloric acid, which dissociates fully, so we also have the concentration of the hydrochloric acid as one mole per decimeter cubed. As with the gas half cells we've looked at before, we also include the platinum electrode to provide a surface for the reaction to take place on and a way to bring electrons in or take electrons out of the half cell. We connect the two half cells into a circuit to be able to measure the standard electrode potential of the one we're interested in. So in this example, we're trying to find out the standard electrode potential 
of the copper half cell. So we have solid copper forming the electrode and we have a solution that contains Cu2 plus ions and those have a concentration of one mole per decimeter cube. We're connected to the hydrogen electrode and we've just seen how to label that. When we connect the two cells, we now have two new components in our cell diagram that we haven't met before. This component here and this component here. So let's look at what those are and what role they play. Firstly, we have the salt bridge, which is this strip here, which connects the solutions in the two half cells. The salt bridge contains free ions, which complete the circuit so charge can flow. To be able to generate any electricity or to be able to measure the potential to generate electricity, we need to have a completed circuit. So the bridge is usually made from paper soaked in a salt, which provide the charged ions. Common salts to use are potassium nitrate or ammonium nitrate. Our other new component is called a high resistance voltmeter. And it's shown by this symbol, where we have a circle with a V in it and two wires connecting the half cells. The high resistance voltmeter tells us the difference in standard potentials of the half cells measured in volts. This effectively tells us the magnitude at which electrons are being pushed round the cell. The reason it's high resistance is so it can stop these electrons flowing and measure how hard they're being pushed. So it's important to remember that it is a high resistance voltmeter. The hydrogen half cell is assigned a standard electrode potential of zero volts. This is what makes it a reference, because when we connect these two, the hydrogen half cell has zero volts, and the copper half cell will have its standard electrode potential, whatever that may be, and the voltmeter will tell us the difference between these two values. When we're having the difference between these two things and one is zero, this means that the voltmeter just gives a reading of the standard electrode potential of the half cell we're interested in. The above setup gives us the value of the standard electrode potential for the half cell on the right. It's convention to show the half cell we're interested in on the right and the hydrogen half cell on the left. The formal definition of a standard electrode potential is that it's the EMF, this stands for electromotive force, and is just a measure of how much the electrons are being pushed around a circuit, and it's the EMF generated by the half cell when it's connected to the standard hydrogen electrode. It needs to be standard conditions. So this is 298 Kelvin, 100 kilopascals of pressure, and all solutions have a concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed. As far as the numbers we get for the standard electrode potentials, a positive reading and a positive number for standard electrode potential means that the half cell accepts electrons from the hydrogen half cell. So electrons are flowing in this direction, where the green is the hydrogen half cell. This means that the hydrogen half cell is generating the electrons, so becomes the negative terminal in the cell. The reduction half cell, the other one, is accepting the electrons, so this becomes the positive terminal in the cell. Because, remember, opposite charges attract, so the electrons are attracted towards the positive one, and like charges repel, so the electrons are pushed away from the negative terminal. This is why it's a positive number for the reading, because the half cell is the positive terminal. A negative number for standard electrode potential means that the half cell donates electrons to the hydrogen half cell. We have the system moving in the other direction, and this time the half cell we're interested in becomes the negative terminal, and the hydrogen half cell becomes the positive terminal. This is why it's a negative number for the standard electrode potential. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level chemistry resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revised smiley face and together let's make A-level chemistry a walk in the park.